Good morning and welcome to Pine Street Baptist Church as we gather together to worship God, to celebrate mothers, and to celebrate 166 years as a congregation in this place. As we prepare our hearts and minds for this time of worship, I invite you to join me as we responsibly read our call to worship. Sing to our God a new song. God has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Pray for a joyous song and sing praises. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we gather in your presence to worship in spirit and in truth. Our minds cannot fully understand you, but our hearts always cry out to you. Our eyes see the wonder of your presence all around us, and we know that you are here. Our faith cannot grasp you, but we reach out to you with the open arms of our worship. In this hour, renew our vision of your eternal love. Refresh our memories of former days and open our eyes to your presence in this community of grace. In praise, in prayer, in song, in the reading of scripture, may our worship be acceptable to you. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Our opening hymn, The Church's One Foundation. Which is one foundation is Jesus Christ the Lord. She is his new creation by spirit and the word. From them he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he Gracious Heavenly Father, we have been so blessed by you over the past more than a year. And most of our people in this congregation, as far as we know, have not been sick from COVID. At least I have not heard anything. So we have been immensely blessed. You have taken care of your children and saw to it that we could still be together, even though we had to wear a mask, use sanitizer, try not to touch up every piece of the church, 
so it has to be washed. But Lord, we want to thank you. It's a blessing. And it's a, a gift from you that we've been able to attend church during this time. Thank you, God, for all that you do for us, for the programs in this church and the teachers that take care of the children and the ministry that goes on, music and otherwise, Clint and Philip and Marie that takes care of everything. It's because these people love this church and they have all found it with grace, taking care of everything and making sure that we still have a church to come to. Now, God, as you have given us so much, we give back a portion of what you have endowed us with so that we can still share the programs and teach the children and come to this church and worship you. We thank you, God, for the many blessings you have given us. And thank you for watching over us during this time. Thank you, God. Amen. where love can dwell and all can safely live a place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive built of hopes and dreams and visions rock of faith and vault of grace hear the love of Christ shall end Divisions all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak.
for the days that we are currently in and for all the years that are ahead of us. Let us also remember Annis and Charlotte Blair. Uh, for those who may not know, they were in a car accident uh, this past week. Charlotte uh, suffered a broken sternum and had to spend a couple of days in the hospital, but they are both at home right now. And we also remember Virginia Knighton, who's recently been diagnosed with late stage pancreatic cancer and is currently in <coughs> hospice care. Let us turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, we turn our attention toward the needs of others and lift them up to you. On this day, we honor our mothers and those who have been like mothers to us, and we thank you for them. We celebrate the strides we have made toward overcoming and moving forward, even as the pandemic continues. We pray for those who do not yet have the same reason to celebrate. <coughs> Places like the nation of India, where the pain and sorrow of death hangs like a dark cloud. We pray for their health, for their welfare, and for all those who seek to help them in these days. We pray for our church, 166 years as a steadfast community of grace. And even as we have experienced your grace, May we be a congregation that openly, freely, and joyfully extends that grace to others. We lift to you the hungry and the homeless, those with hearts broken and hearts filled with sorrow, those who are lonely and those who are alone. Whoever the person, whatever the need, Wherever the place, we lift them all to you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of John, and I'd like to share with you from the 15th chapter. And I'd be reading verses 9 through 17. Jesus' life is drawing toward an end he is speaking words of comfort and assurance to his closest friends as he prepares for what is ahead so let us hear the gospel of john the 15th chapter and i'll read verses 9 through 17. jesus here speaking to us as the father has loved me so i have loved you now remain in my love if you keep my command, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. May we bow together in prayer. Three words, love each other, Lord. A command you gave to us to be your people in this world, to be the kind of family that represents your love. We confess we have not always done it well, but we also recognize the gift and the wonder that is being a part of your family. And for the individuals that have been parts of our lives throughout our journeys who have impacted us in such a way that we are better individuals for it. 
We are grateful, Lord, to be a part of your family. We are grateful that you call us friends and that we can be a friend to one another. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just last Sunday, a week ago now, I was talking with a couple who had come to visit our church as their son was one of those students playing in the VCU guitar ensemble. First time they had ever been in our congregation. So in the course of our congregation, I shared with them about our church. And as part of that conversation, they shared with me how they noticed that everybody who walked in that morning seemed to know one another well. They shared with me that it was more than just, you know, a casual greeting of hello, but that there was no doubt some significant relationships they were observing. Indeed, in any church setting, it is always the hope that the deep bonds of relationships are formed over time. As Christians, when we share our lives together in a community of faith, we share significant experiences together. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. But they all have a way of creating relationships that are close, that are supportive, and that are steadfast. When someone ever asks me what is the best thing about being a pastor of the same church for 30 years, I always say, well, it's the relationships. And when they ask me what the most difficult thing is, I always say, well, it's the relationships. <laughs> or at least the relationships when they come to an end. Because of people leaving our church family and stepping into eternity after their deaths. Yet we would not trade these relationships, even with the great heartache of having to say goodbye at times to those individuals in our lives. As it is often said, better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. Well, Jesus loved his friends. As Jesus began his ministry, one of the first things that he did was to call certain individuals to be his disciples. Twelve we know of. But Jesus had many more significant relationships, like Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, or Mary Magdalene, or Bartimaeus, who had been blind, and even that little guy Zacchaeus, the tax collector that he met hanging from a sycamore tree. You see, Jesus knew that for him to carry out the work that God had called him to do, he would need the support and encouragement of those friends around him. Even the Son of God, Jesus desired relationships with ordinary people, people who would walk with him through his life in both the good and the bad that came Jesus' way. Jesus indeed loved his friends. Well, as Jesus' ministry and earthly life was drawing to an end, Jesus shared with his disciples how much he loved them, as well as reminded them that they were more than servants, but they were his friends. Jesus cared deeply for each one of them, even though they would all soon abandon him or deny him, and one would even betray him. But not even these disloyal acts would keep Jesus from loving them. Indeed, Jesus invites them to share the same kind of love with one another, to be a friend to one another, to sacrifice for one another. And so in Jesus' relationship to them, Jesus demonstrated what a friend of faith looks like. Well, here we are today in this place, Pine Street, our church home, with our church family and with our friends. As followers of Jesus today, we can trust that Jesus offers to us the same friendship 
that he gave to those original disciples. A relationship of love. We're here today because of God's love in Jesus Christ for each one of us. And then together as the church family. In many ways, we are like spokes that are on a bicycle wheel. The hub there is in the middle and then each individual spoke comes off that hub and, hub and together it makes the wheel. We're like that. Christ is our hub. It is what unites us and brings us together. It's what bonds us in a relationship that is able to withstand the tension of living in a world where relationships can easily be broken, where relationships can easily end. It is our unity in Christ that makes us who we are. I like the way that the great German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it. He said the church is not a religious community of worshipers of Christ, but it is Christ himself who has taken up the form of the people. You see, as the body of Christ in the world, as the church, Christ Jesus now abides in us and we abide in him. And where that abiding takes place, that is where you will discover the richness and the fullness of God's love. The question for us then is how is this love demonstrated in our family, in our church? Well, throughout Jesus' life, he conveyed God's love through his actions. Jesus didn't simply talk about God's love through his words, but he demonstrated them through what he did. And so our church, too, must be seen in its love for one another. As Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples. They'll know you're my friends. They'll know you're part of my family because of your love for one another. It must be a love, then, that is willing to sacrifice for each other. Jesus tells us in our scripture, no one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. When we commit to the family of God, we commit to sacrifice for one another. We're called to love one another with sacrificial hearts and spirit. You see, we don't unite with the church or the body of Christ with the question of what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? But rather we ask, how can I give and how can I serve those around? God's love should lead us to sacrificially give to one another and love one another. Over the last 30 years with you, I've seen this kind of love in the lives of people in this church. I've witnessed individuals sacrificed for one another in so many different ways. Some which were very evident because they couldn't be hidden because of the scope of them. Yet there's also been so many small, unnoticed sacrifices of individuals of others who have cared for one another simply out of the sole reason of love for them. These acts of sacrifice go a long way in strengthening the body of Christ. Every act of sacrifice that we do for one another reinforces the bond that builds up the house of God in this place. When we're willing to lay down our lives for those around us, when we're willing to give of ourselves every bit of who we are to our brother and sister in Christ, then God's love becomes stronger and stronger and stronger within the body itself. We're called as friends to sacrifice for one another because that's what Jesus has done for us. And not only should our love be for one another be sacrificial, but it must also be a love that is willing to give and to receive forgiveness. <clears throat> forgiveness was at the heart of Jesus' life. In Jesus, God extended grace to each of us. 
even in our sinfulness. Jesus knew we weren't perfect. He knew that we would let him down. He knew that we would disappoint him over and over again, but he forgave us and he continues to forgive us. And thus we have to be willing to forgive each other. There's no doubt that all of us at times have said or done things that have hurt others. Likewise, things have been said and done which have brought hurt and pain into our own lives. And as much as we try to always be loving towards one another, sometimes we're not. We're still frail and sinful human beings that sometimes our sin wounds the other people in our lives that we call our Christian friends. I grew up going to church, as many of you did, ever since I can remember. I have church memories. And I can also remember my parents telling me what to do and not to do in church. And one rule I remember growing up, hearing when I was a young child, that there was to be no running in the church building. As a kid, I didn't understand why. Why can't you run? But as an adult, I do. One, the child running could get hurt, many have. Or the child running could accidentally run into someone else and hurt them as well. So I knew early on that physically running in the church was not a good idea. Well, as an adult, however, I learned, now still spending my entire life in some church, that we often allow unforgiveness to run through the church and into each other's lives. It is easy to allow grudges or ill will or anger to fester with any social group. But in the church, it always stands in direct contradiction to the ways of Jesus. As Paul would write to those Christians in the church in Ephesus, he said, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Jesus himself would even teach in the Sermon on the Mount. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. Be first reconciled to your brother or sister and then come offer your gift. You see, unforgiveness has no place in the church, yet so often we can welcome it in as a guest. And so what that means for some of us is that we need to go and offer forgiveness to another or finally receive the forgiveness that's offered to us. Unforgiveness, we know, over time can affect the entire foundation of any group of people, including the church. Now, we know that it's not good to have cracks in the foundation of your home. And if you let it go and don't fix it, it will create further damage down the road. If you don't fix it, the foundation, mold and mildew can seep in those cracks, causing the wooden beams under your house to deteriorate. And so wherever there are cracks or poor ceiling around the house, water can make its way into it. And wood rot gets worse over time. That's a mistake that many homeowners have made, putting off fixing the foundation, but in the long run, it can be expensive in many ways. Unforgiveness can have such an effect in our lives when we don't address it. And if it's only something that we can do as individuals, we have to deal with the unforgiveness in our own lives. You see, we can't be a community of grace where there are cracks of ungrace within the body. I've seen it happen in families. I've seen it happen in friendships. I've seen it happen in clubs and groups and workplaces and yes, even the church. We have to be willing to forgive as we have been forgiven. Otherwise, we're just talking a good in the game while the foundation continues to crack. Philip Brooks, who gave us the familiar lyrics to the Christmas song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, also once said, forgive, forget, 
Bear with the faults of others as you would have them bear with yours. Be patient and understanding. Life's too short to be vengeful, vengeful or malicious. You see, forgiveness should be at the heart of the church. And it must be the beat that keeps the rhythm of the church moving within its life. Jesus demonstrated what forgiveness looks like. And then he asked us as his children, as his family, and as his friends to simply go and do likewise. <clears throat> but then finally, our love for one another should not lead us not only to sacrifice for one another and forgive one another, but it should also lead us to love others outside the community of faith. A church that doesn't love beyond its walls merely becomes a social club with some religious symbols. We can't keep God's love to ourselves, but it has to be shared through acts of love and kindness, and compassion and mercy to others. God's love in Jesus Christ should be the motivation for everything we do as the body of Christ. Indeed, the central mark of the church is how it is loving those around it. William Temple, the one-time Bishop of Manchester, said famously, the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not its members. We're here as a church family, not asking what's in it for us, but what can we be for others? Everything that we do as a church family should be preceded by the question of how does our love and how does it affect the lives of those outside our circle of friends? Let us always love as we have been loved. Love can never be contained behind brick and mortar walls and stained glass. Love can never be limited to an hour on Sunday. But God's love must become evident in us beyond who we are in this place. And how we live in the world and how we treat others. And how we care for those around us. How we give kindness and compassion and mercy to the people that cross our way. That's how they'll know who we are. That's how they'll know that we're a part of God's family. That's how they'll know that we're brothers and sisters in Christ when we sacrificially give of ourselves in love and grace and mercy, even to those who aren't a part of the family of faith. So today we recognize 166 years of trying to carry out our Lord's work and his command to love one another. We all wish that we could say that we have done it perfectly, but we don't always get it right. Yet we kept, keep pressing forward with God's love and grace showing us the way forward. And when we follow God's love and allow it to lead us as a church, then everything else will fall into place. And so in gratitude, we thank God for one another as Christian friends today. We thank God for the love that we have experienced here in this church family over the course of our living. We thank God for the people who have touched our lives, both living and now those living in the presence of eternity. We thank God for the difference that each person makes in our lives. We recognize each person as a gift. That's our calling as a church. Jesus said, I'll be your friend. If you follow a command, love one another. Because if we can't love one another, then we're not going to understand what it means to be loved by our Lord. So let us commit to being the kind of people God has called us to be. Loving, sacrificial, forgiving, and reaching beyond ourselves, and all along the way reminding ourselves 
that we all get by with a little help from our friends. May we bow together. Lord, we thank you again that you allow us to be a part of this people. We thank you for each one that has made up the body of Christ at Pine Street, both in the past and in the present. We thank you that we have a place where we can worship you and to offer our praise and thanksgiving each week. We thank you that we have a place where we can break bread with one another. We thank you when we have a place where we can laugh and cry, encourage and support one another. We thank you for a place that where we can be forgiven and where we can practice forgiveness. And we thank you for a place that allows us to be your people in the larger world, sharing your love with one another. Bless us, Lord, as we move forward. Bless us each and every day as your children. And bless us as the body of Pine Street Baptist Church. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every Sunday in which we share the Lord's Supper, we share in the song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. And so that is our final song today, a little longer version. We don't always sing all the verses, but listen to the verses, read the words that are on the screen. And as we do, may we individually continue to commit ourselves to Christ our Lord and to commit ourselves to one another. And may God always bless the tie that binds us here together. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims, our and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other falls the sympathizing tear. When we asunder part, it gives us sinward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again.
and sin we shall be free and perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity